Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could join us this morning for worship. I encourage you to please join, join with us as we sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. preaching about the blessed hope of the return of Jesus Christ when we'll go to heaven and be with him forever. I'd like to invite you to read along in the scriptures with me tonight, or this morning, I keep doing that, this morning, uh, from Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Give you a second to find it, and let's read it together. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give him food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of. And he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to invite you to pray along with us and remember a couple of our people uh, 
Our dear sister Mildred is in the hospital. She had a stroke this week, and so she's at St. Mary's Hospital. Also, Michael Connolly is still in the hospital in Springfield, and we're, of course, praying for uh, the family of uh, Dylan, who was involved in a fatal car accident last week, and a lady was killed. And I want to appreciate all of you that have been praying for my aunt, uh, my Aunt Ruth in Chicago. She went to, home to be with the Lord on Wednesday this week, and so we thank you for praying for her and remembering her. Also, we give thanks tonight, or today, <laughs> we're recording this at night, There's, the secret's out. <laughs> okay. We're very thankful at this time because our, our, uh, our governor had a court uh, challenge to his executive ruling and it was struck down, it was required that it be changed so that churches are now declared to be essential businesses. And so those of you listening at home, you can come back next week and it'll be okay. Uh, we'd love to have you all here and uh, hopefully things will be opening up uh, and getting a little bit back to normal soon. Let's go to the Lord. Our Father, we thank you tonight, today. <laughs> we thank you this week, Lord. Oh my goodness. We thank you for the opportunity to look at your word, to hear what you have to say to us, the, the warnings and the promises that will come when Jesus comes to take us home. We look forward to that, Lord. We pray that we might be found doing your work and faithfully obeying you. Your word says, Lord, that when the master comes, will he find faith in the earth? And I pray, Lord, that that we would be faithfully serving you and, and busy about your business. Lord, we lift up these of our number that are uh, in the hospital at this time. We pray for Mildred. We pray for Michael. Uh, we pray for uh, Claudia's daughter-in-law, uh, for Marianne, who's still recovering from kidney stones. We pray, Lord, for Dylan. And I thank you, Lord, for the assurance that my Aunt Ruth is home with you in heaven. And we just uh, pray now that you would be with us as we worship you, as we open your word, and that people listening to this message and this service would get a blessing and would be challenged and convicted. And Lord, that there may be some that would hear your word and know that they need to repent and come to you and receive your gift of salvation. And I pray especially that your word would uh, accomplish its intended purpose as it touches their hearts as they listen to this recording. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless our time of worship and our time of study of your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. We will continue our worship this morning with hymn number 199. Lo, he comes with the clouds descending.
Well, let's see if I can figure out what time it is here. <laughs> you know, I, I, we just sang a song that is normally, the, the tune is uh, from a, a, what my favorite Christmas carol. And I was saying before we started here that uh, the last verse of that Christmas carol would be entirely appropriate for what we're looking at here tonight. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship. And I guess it's kind of fitting that, as it says in our text here, that no one knows the day or the hour. So I guess I'm fitting right into that. But anyway, um, we've been looking at what is called the Olivet Discourse, the sermon that Jesus preached uh, to his, primarily to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a mountain just to the east of Jerusalem. It overlooks the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley runs through and separates the Temple Mount, the eastern face of the Temple Mount, from the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is kind of between Jerusalem and uh, Bethany, which was where Jesus stayed with his, uh, his good friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And we're told in the text and in Luke's Gospel that he had been preaching in the, in the Temple Courts and then spending the evenings and the Mount of Olives and, and with, with his friends. So it's likely, again, that this was in the evening as they sat out and looked across the valley at the, at the Temple Mount. And you remember back in the beginning of the chapter, we said that the whole conversation was prompted by the question that Jesus' disciples put to him when they said, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And we're going to look at those questions tonight as sort of the basis of our study of this portion of the scriptures, of the message. Jesus answered in the beginning of uh, his, his answer here in uh, verses 4 on down through 14 by telling them that, that there would be many, many cataclysmic world events uh, taking place, natural disasters, political upheavals, wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilences. How appropriate is that that we study this at this time? And then he said, false Christs, false messiahs, and false prophets would arise. And he said, this is the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning of literally birth pangs. But the end was not yet. Verses 6 and verse 8. Verse 8. 6 and 8, he says, uh, this is just the beginning of sorrows. The end is not yet. So I believe he was saying to them, look, every time something happens, every time there's a natural disaster, an earthquake, a famine, a, a, a wicked, despotic ruler comes along, don't necessarily just assume that that's the end of the world. It's not the end of the world yet. And he warns us very emphatically in these passages not to be deceived. Not to be deceived because one of the signs at the end would be uh, this powerful world ruler that would deceive many with signs and wonders and, and all manner of lying signs and wonders, he says. So let's take this section apart and, and answer these questions as, as Jesus does here. Number one, what will be the sign or signs of your coming? Jesus said there would be signs. So he says in verse number uh, 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Now this is what we usually refer to as the Antichrist. No, but number one, the first sign he mentions is the abomination of desolation seated in the temple, proclaiming himself to be God and demanding to be worshipped as God, he says, let us understand and flee for the hills. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, he says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. That's the apostasy, falling away from the faith. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself or purporting himself 
to be God. Verse 9, the coming of this lawless one is according to the working or the power of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God, listen, God will send them a strong delusion that they may believe the lie. And in Matthew 24 and verse 21, he says, there will be a time of great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. Now, last week we looked at the order of events immediately after the tribulation of those days. It says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, here's what's going to happen. And But the first sign I believe that Jesus gives us here is the sign of the abomination of desolation. The second sign, letter B, is the sign of the Son of Man, verse 30. Actually, verse 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We saw that in Acts chapter 2. that says that that will come before the great day of the Lord. Verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The second sign is the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Verse 30. And the Bible says he'll come, in verse 31, with the sound of a great trumpet and gather his elect. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's that word harpazo, which you get the word rapture. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And we're told in second and I'm sorry, first Thessalonians chapter five and verse two, and second Peter chapter three and verse ten, that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night. So the first sign to look for is the abomination of desolation seated in the holy place in the temple. The second sign, he says, after the tribulation of those days is the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, with the sound of a trumpet and gathering his elect into the cloud to meet him in the air. And so we will be with the Lord. And that day, it says, will come as a thief in the night. The third sign that he, he doesn't specifically identify as a sign here, but I think um, it certainly qualifies, and this is where we take up today in our text, verse 32, the sign of the fig tree. What is the sign of the fig tree? Well, we've talked about this many, many times here, and you know that the fig tree almost always is used as a representation of the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. Remember, uh, the, the tribulation time, this, this time of great tribulation that will come upon the earth, is figured against the Jewish people. Uh, Daniel 9 and verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. For your people and your holy city. That is the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 speaks of this time, we believe, although it doesn't specifically state it. It says, Alas, that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. Jacob, of course, was the name, that the, the given name of Israel, who God changed his name to Israel, and, and he became the, the, uh, the father of the, the, the 12 tribes. And I want you to point. I want to point something out to you here. Again, we looked last week at the the idea that um, the the day of the Lord and 
uh, in Revelation 3 and verse 10, it talks about how uh, you'll be saved. I said a proper wor wording would be through that hour, not out, not away from that hour or kept out of that hour, but kept through that hour, saved from that hour. Here, I want you to notice the wording here in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, as it says, uh, this will be the time of Jacob's trouble, but he who, Jacob, shall be saved out of it. It's the same construction here. It, it, this is in Hebrew, of course, but it's the same idea. He'll be saved out of it. He will be saved. He'll come out of that tribulation time. Not that he won't go through it. And, and I don't think anyone believes that Israel won't go through the tribulation time, right? But here it clearly says that Jacob will be saved out of the tribulation. So anyway, the, the sign of the fig tree. He says, when the fig tree, I'm reading in verse 32, when, when the fig tree... When, when its branch is already tender and it puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, let me go back and review something that, again, we've talked about very often here, but I realize everybody maybe listening into this hasn't heard, hasn't been following our messages all along. Israel is always pictured as the fig tree. Or I should say the fig tree is always used as a picture of Israel. And when we think of Israel's calendar year, they had a series of festivals and holy days that I believe were arranged prophetically to give us a, an object lesson. Their year, their, their religious year, not their civil year, the Jews have two new years. The, 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 the religious uh, holy new year begins in the spring and the civil year begins in, in the fall. I'll come to that in a moment. The year begins with Passover. Passover is when the, the Jews, you know, came out of Egypt and they, they uh, killed a lamb. They took the blood and they spattered it on the doorposts of their house. And, and they uh, observed with unleavened bread and, and wine and, and all of those things were very deeply symbolic to them. But Passover... We believe Passover, as Christians, we believe Passover was a picture of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He became our Passover. Simultaneously with the Feast of Passover is the, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Unleavened Bread symbolizes Jesus' sinless life. Leaven is always used as a picture of sin. So during the Passover season, the Jews only eat unleavened bread, and it's cooked a special way. And it pictures, again, Jesus' sinlessness, okay? So we have Passover and then unleavened bread, and then the Feast of first fruits, which comes three days later. Jesus is described as the first fruits of them that slept in his resurrection. So that we have Passover and unleavened bread symbolizing the sinless life of Jesus, Passover, his death, uh, first fruits symbolizing his resurrection, and then 50 days after Passover comes what is called Shavuot or Pentecost, and that's called the Feast of Weeks. And it is a time that symbolizes, that, that commemorates the beginning of the barley harvest, that symbolizes the beginning of the harvest of the Gentiles. Here's what it says in Leviticus 23, right after the introduction of Shavuot. It says, when you reap, Leviticus 23, 30, 22, I'm sorry, 23, 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. When you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Now, yesterday, I mowed my lawn. When I mow my lawn, I was taught when I was a little boy mowing the lawn for my dad, you overlap your rows so you don't leave any grass, any grass sticking up in between your rows. And you get all the way over to the corner. You back up and you get into the corners. You don't leave any areas that you missed. And if you did, you know, dad would say, you know, you missed a spot. Go out there and clean that up. Here, God tells his people, don't do that. No, deliberately miss some spots. Don't overlap your rows. Leave some grass, so not some grass, but some crops standing in between. And, and don't, you know, cut the corners. Leave the corners standing. 
And if you drop something as you're coming in, just leave it there. It's there for the stranger. It's there for the, the Gentile, the foreigner in your land. And that's the picture we have of the Gentiles coming to Christ. Jesus was and is the Messiah of Israel. Well, how do we as Gentiles, a Norwegian like myself, how do I get in on this offer of grace? Because the Jews rejected their own Messiah, and now we are the beneficiaries of their rejection of Messiah. And that's the instruction that's given right there at the moment that the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot is being introduced. Then comes the summer of the year. In the summer, and he says here, you know that the summer is near when you see the fig tree putting forth its leaves. We said that the fig tree puts forth its leaves. Fig leaves always symbolize religion. And when the Jews were in the heyday, the height of their religion was during the time of Jesus' first coming. But there was no fruit on the fig tree. The fruit comes in the fall. The summer comes... The summer of the year is symbolic of this time that we're living in right now, known as the church age or the Gentile pause, if you will. And the Bible says he is near. He is even at the doors. It's not that God has forgotten his people. In fact, he's standing at the doors ready to come. Last week we looked and we saw how at the, so at the sounding of the seventh trumpet and just before that seventh bowl of wrath was poured out, the door was opened in heaven. The Messiah was ready to come. And there was a great voice that came out of the temple. He is near even at the doors. So then in the fall, the Jewish civil new year begins with the blowing of, of trumpets, the ram's horn, the, the shofar. And that's the Feast of Trumpets. And it is followed soon after by the Day of Atonement, in which the heavens are opened, symbolizing this time of the coming of Jesus, Messiah. And that's followed by the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot, which represents the rest of the Millennial Kingdom. Luke speaks, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, in, in Luke's Gospel, in Luke 21 and verse 20, when he talks about the abomination of desolation coming, Antichrist coming, here's what he says. He says in verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. What's the sign of the abomination of desolation? Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by foreign armies, know that the time of its desolation is near. Verse 24, he says, They will fall by the edge of the sword and, the Lord, and, and be led away captive unto all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trampled down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. What is the time of the Gentiles? The time of the Gentiles began in 586 B.C. It speaks of the trampling underfoot of the city of Jerusalem by the Gentile nations. I want to tell you that Jerusalem was trampled down by the Gentiles from 586 B.C. until 1967 in our day. 1967. And this is what it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. It says, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this, this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, God has a plan. God has a perfect plan and a specific number of his elect from the Gentiles. And he's waiting until the last of the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then the time of the Gentiles will be fully fulfilled. Verse 34. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation shall by no means pass away until all these things take place. Now, what does that mean? Confusing verse. Let me give you a couple of possible meanings. First of all, uh, one possibility is that when he says this generation, he's talking about those who are alive on earth and would live to see the fall of Jerusalem. It's called the preterist position. There's a lot of good scriptural reason to believe that. Uh, of course, the fall of Jerusalem came in 70 AD, but we see things about that that 
are obviously yet unfulfilled. And so even if we hold to a position like that, there still is a, a, a foreshadowing, a, a prophetic message about this. The second possibility is that he's talking about the generation that, lit, that is alive and sees these things come to pass will not pass away until all things are fulfilled. In other words, it won't take more than a generation for everything. Once this starts, it'll be done quickly. That's another possibility. The one that I lean toward believing is the third. The word generation here is genea. Genea usually is translated race or kind or family or stock or breed. We get the word genus from this word, genea. And so I believe, this is my personal opinion, that when he says this generation shall not pass away, he's talking about the Jewish people. The Jewish people will never be wiped out. Think of all the times that wicked, evil men have tried to exterminate them. We only need to think of Adolf Hitler and his insanity. But given the context here of speaking of the fig tree, I think that that's the most uh, probable meaning of, of that verse, that the Jewish people, and he's talking about, look, there's going to be a time when the, God is going to bring blindness upon the Jewish people and break them off of the tree. But they will be, in, in Romans chapter 10, 11, 12, or 10 and 11 rather, grafted back in. He's not rejecting his people utterly. They will not ever be eliminated from the earth. Psalm 89 makes that clear. He says, if my people you know, reject me and, and turn away from me, I'll visit them with a the rod, but I'll never withdraw my promise that I've made once I've sworn to David, their father. Uh, Psalm 119 in verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. He has made with them an everlasting covenant, Jer uh, Jeremiah 32 and Ezekiel 16 and 37 and many other passages talk about that. So I believe, again, it's my personal opinion that he's saying this generation, this race of people, the Jewish nation will not pass away. That's an opinion, okay? Second question, when is the end of the age? When will it come? What is the sign of your coming? He gives us the abomination of desolation, the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds, and the sign of the fig tree. Okay, so when? That's the what. what what's the when? When will this end of the age come? When will it come? Verse 36. He says, But of the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, and listen to this, but my Father only. Now, I want to ask you something. Do you think that that's still true? That no, that even even Jesus, he says, not not even the Son of Man knows. Do you think that's still true? I don't. I'll tell you why. I think that when Jesus was on Earth, he willingly and voluntarily imposed certain limitations upon himself. Philippians 2, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Echinosin, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He limited himself. For example, God is omnipresent, is he not? God is omnipresent. But was Jesus omnipresent? No, he became flesh. He, he took on a human body. He was now located in that human body. He was either in, you know, Jerusalem or Nazareth or Galilee. Or wherever he was is where he was. Now, could he also be everywhere? Yes, he could because he's God. But in his humanity, he took on physical limitations. Uh, God is eternal. But Jesus was born as a baby. And the Bible speaks of him being about 12 years old, about 30 years old, Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter 3 and verse 23. So we're keeping time now of how old Jesus is. He's existing in time, even though as God, he is absolutely eternal. God is omniscient. There's times in the Bible where the Bible says Jesus didn't commit himself to these people because he knew all things about them. There's also times when you know, he was walking through a crowd and some woman grabbed onto his garment. He turned around and he said, wait, who touched me? He asked questions. Now, again, and I've said this, he wasn't looking for information. He had a purpose in asking. But 
there were things that here he says, no one knows the day or the hour. But here's what happened when Jesus returned to heaven. Revelation 1 and verse 1. And if you have your Bible open, you might want to turn to that verse. Because I want to show you something. Depending on what kind of a Bible you have. If you have an old Bible, uh, an old uh, particularly like a Schofield reference Bible. It'll say up at the title, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. The Revelation of St. John the Divine. My Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's correct. Okay, Look at verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it, by his angel to his servant John. The revelation of Jesus Christ, notice, which God gave to him. So I believe that when Jesus returned to heaven, following his ascension, God, the word revelation here is apocalypto, which means to take the cover off of something. God unveiled him. We sing the songs of Christmas time, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Um, well, God removed that veil and showed Jesus, I believe, everything that is to come. So I believe that Jesus knows when he'll return. It's a side point, but what does he tell us in the text? He says, look at verses 37, 38. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. We see here not uh, anything, you know, sinfulness or, or wickedness so much, but just being oblivious to the spiritual reality. They're preoccupied with the things of this life. They were, verse 39 says, unaware. And so shall it be at the, at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Again, speaking to the Jews and using that messianic title, Son of Man. Luke 21 says this, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on those who dwell on the face of all the earth. They had received warnings. Noah had preached to them 120 years. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 says, God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world on the ungodly. So I believe that we'll have an idea of when he's coming because we are tuned in to his word and we're, we're studying his word. But the world is going to be oblivious to these things. They won't get it. Pardon me. Second thing he says, one will be taken, one will be left. The Greek word there is paralambanatai. It means taken away or taken alongside of. It's like uh, there's two people walking down the road and someone comes along and just scoops one of them away and, and, and uh, rushes them off. And, and the implication here of this word is that they'll be taken away to judgment. Verse 39, notice it says, the flood came and took them away. The main point here is that there will be a separation, a dividing of the people. We're going to see that in a couple of weeks. We look at the separating of the sheep and the goats and also the suddenness of it, how quickly it comes. Again, the third thing he says is um, in verse 42, Watch, therefore, for you don't know the hour the Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. We saw that last week about the thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. And when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness. Listen. You, brethren, are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. So 
So I believe it will be possible for us who belong to Christ to know not the day or the hour, but to know the season that he'll return. We, we will be aware that it's coming. Don't you know that now? I mean, as we go through this coronavirus shutdown, don't you just feel like, you know, God is about to do something. And I'm not saying that this is anything related to the tribulation. I told you last week, I believe it's a, maybe if anything, a dress rehearsal, a dry run, a, a preparation, a softening up. But I believe, you know, you look at this and for, for the very fact that when this happens, Christian people are asking, okay, what is God doing in this? What does this have to do with God's kingdom? What's our response to be as Christians, right? The world doesn't think that way. The world is oblivious. You know, the world is scared to death of this. They're fearful. I talk to lost people and they are just scared to death. I saw people today without masks on. Don't they know they're going to kill us all? It's the world's, you know, the, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. And yet Christian people are like, you know, I'm ready. Don't you know that when God says it's time, it's time, right? So we'll know. We'll have an idea. I'm not saying, again, that we can set a date certain or the day or the hour, but we'll know when the time is near. Number three. So the first question was, what will be the sign of your coming? Number two, when will the end of the age come? Number three, what are we to do? What are we to do? Well, I told you a couple weeks ago. I told you last week the same thing. Number one, verse 42, look at it. Watch, therefore. Watch, therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Watch. What does watch mean? Well, we watch TV, watch, watch this, you know. No, the word watch, you know what it literally means? It means stay awake. Stay awake. Be alert. Someone once told me that the world needs more alerts. So be alert, right? Watch. Verse 43. If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Uh, chapter 25 and verse 13. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Notice he always says the day or the hour. He doesn't say the year. Or, you know, I think we'll know it's coming. But he says no one knows the day or the hour. Number two, I told you this. Be ready. Be ready. Verse 44. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler of his household to give him food in his season? Blessed is that servant whom his master when he comes will find so doing. Assuredly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come in a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of. And look at verse 51. He will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you know that the parables that are going to follow parable of the wise and foolish virgins, the parable of the talents, parable of the, parable of the sheep and goats, or the judgment of the sheep and goats. All warn us to be ready. If he comes sooner than anticipated, we need to be ready. Oh Lord, I wasn't expecting you. I thought it would be later. Or if he delays, it comes later than we expected. I mean, think of these disciples hearing this and realize it's been 2,000 years. It may not be for a while. So hunker down and get, get ready to endure. What do I always say? Be ready for him to come at any moment, but be ready also to endure whatever may come until he comes. It's been 2,000 years. 2,000 years of living in the last days. And I believe there were 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. So it's going to balance out at some point. Be ready. Verse 44. Be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And thirdly, 
Finally, be a witness. Look at verse 46. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. Oh, what is doing what? Giving bread to the household, giving food in their due season. The same question the disciples asked back in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And what did he say in verse 7? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now think of this. Jesus said that even he didn't know the day or the hour in verse 36, right? But Jesus did say, do you not know that I must be about my Father's business in Luke chapter 2 and 49? Jesus said, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work in John 4 and verse 34. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day for the night is coming when no one can work in John 9 and verse 4. We need to be working. We need to be witnessing. Verse 46, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. When Jesus was on the cross in John 19 and verse 30, he cried out, it is finished. Jesus lived to finish the work of his father. In Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15, when that last trumpet sounds, behold, I come as a thief, it says, and the last bowl is poured out. The very next verse says, it is finished. Revelation 16 and 17. It isn't over until it's over. And it isn't over until Jesus says it's over, and then it's over. You know what? The devil wants you to think that Jesus is going to come next year. Or that you're going to die. What if you knew you were going to die in a month? How would you live this month? You know, the reality is, none of us know when we're going to die. And if I said, you know, you were going to die tomorrow, I might be wrong. You might die tonight. The devil wants you to think you've got lots of time to think it over. On the other hand, I think the devil also wants you to think that it's never going to come. You don't have to worry about that. That's a long way off. That's not... And, and we see that in the Old Testament. We see that in the book of Ezekiel. Don't say that these judgments are not yet for a long, long time off. No, the time is coming, and it's, it's almost here. The Bible says it's even at the door. So three verses, and I'll wrap this up. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. While it is called today, lest any of you harden, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, we have been partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Second Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All who? All of the ones that will come to repentance. All of the elect. All the ones that he's chosen. Remember 11, Romans eleven twenty five, The fullness of the Gentiles. And in the context of uh, 2 Peter 3, he's asking the question, why has God delayed his coming? And he says, listen, a, a day is like a thousand years, so don't worry about it. God is not slow concerning his promise. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. That means that there is a set number, we would assume, that when that last person is saved, that that's when he's going to come. He says in the next verse, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away, and a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And so 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now 
is the day of salvation. Now, are you ready for Jesus to come? If he were to come, as some, many believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, if he were to come now, if he were to call you home tonight, if you were to die tonight, would you be ready? Would you know that all your sins are forgiven and that you have eternal life and that you have a home reserved for you in heaven? You know, people talk about the rapture. No one knows what a day may bring. Suddenly, there's that word again, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, do you know that General Electric once did a study to find out how long it took for a person to blink their eye? You know what they found out? They said it was one-tenth of a second or 100 milliseconds. Let me ask you this. If you're not ready for Jesus to come, are you going to be ready in the blink of an eye? Be discerning. Be ready. Be watching. More on that next week. And if you're not ready, will you get ready? Will you make ready now? Will you say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know if you were to come and call for me right now, and I were to stand before you in judgment, and you were to judge me by your righteous law, I would be in hell. But I know that Jesus came and died on the cross for me so that I could go to heaven. He took my sin and paid the penalty for my sin, paid the price for my salvation so that I could be saved. So Lord, I want to receive you tonight, today, whatever time it is. I want to receive you as my Savior. Father, I pray that everyone listening to this message would be ready to meet you whenever you choose to come at that day and hour which the Father has set by his own authority. I pray, Lord, that it might not overtake us as a thief, but we, that we might be found watching and busy about our Father's business, making disciples, living and being witnesses for you in our immediate area and to the uttermost part of the earth. And Lord, use us as your lights to shine in this dark world so that people can come to know you. In Jesus' name. Solid Rock.
On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Father, bless those who, are, who have tuned in this morning, Lord. And I pray, Father God, if there's one that's listening, that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that can, would say now, that the Lord were to come, or the Lord were to require their souls of them, or they would not be ready. But Lord God, you would convict them, Lord, you would show them how they could be saved. Lord, may they cry unto you and trust in the finished work at Calvary. And Lord, we rejoice and we thank you. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you all this evening.